Hello and welcome to the Amber Spycast, your one-stop shop for all things His Dark Materials. I'm Alaric and joining me solo <gasps> is Travis. Hi, how are you? We're missing one of our, our three horsemen. Joanna. Horse people. Hello. Happy anniversary, Joanna. Yeah, we miss you. Happy anniversary. You're having a good time. Yes. Uh, so we're soldiering on. We're going to talk about this week and we'll get Joanna's take next week. But we wanted to start talking about what we just witnessed from um, the Lost Boy episode. Yeah. I, t- to open, I sort of thought a little bit about when we read this section in the book and how we all sort of in concert were like, this is something that could be its own significant episode. Mm-hmm. Enough about... Tony Macarios or Billy Costa in the show, there's enough there that you could really live in that moment and suffer. And we were like, it would be a bummer of an episode, but like could be really rich and interesting. And Mm -hmm. we kind of, I mean, they gave us other elements, but they really did let us live with spoilers. You know, what happens to Billy here? Yeah. But apparently you can't make a full episode about it. And it's a good thing that we're not making television and we're making podcasts. But (laughs) half, half an episode, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, everything from the the negotiations to getting to 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 being able to go on her uh, exploratory mission, all the way up through uh, finding Billy and uh, then his final fate, which we'll get on get to in uh, later parts of the show, was um, you know it, it was it was well done. It was it was a lot of good material. Um, There's dark material, as it were. Very dark material. They um, something that happens here early on is we we get a glimpse of our friend Will. I know. That was exciting. I, it was exciting. I, I have. It, a, it was exciting. I had, I had one small reservation about it mm-hmm. because he is such a dominating figure of the in the trilogy. Mm-hmm. Is the Golden Compass is such a Lyra story. Mm-hmm. It's so much about her and her journey. Bringing him in, I'm not going to say it diminishes the shine on Lyra, but it feels like it takes a little bit away from this being her story. Mm-hmm. We're getting we're getting the the subtle knife, which is more his story, really. We're getting a taste of that in this season, and I wonder if does that do you feel like it takes the shine off of Lyra's journey a little bit? Not necessarily. I mean, this is still her series. I mean, number one because Daphne Keene is so awesome. Number right. two, um, you know, she's had six episodes that were all her. True. You know, we've she's she's planted her flag firmly in, in the series. And um, number three, and I think we've touched on this a little bit in, in previous shows. I feel like it's a good idea to start the Will story now, um, because if not, we would have had, you know, two or three episodes in season two without Lyra. Yeah. So it's a good idea that uh, we we start to get these early will will moments from the the things that are happening uh, concurrent with uh, Lyra's story now, and then uh, that way, I guess at the end of the season, the beginning of next season, you know, boom, they'll run in, run into each other. Yeah, it is good to sort of lay that groundwork, and we're getting more and more of it. And Boreal is much more present here in. Mm-hmm. What, the, the sort of watching of Will and understanding his role in this and where he plays in, in maybe this, you know, the hunt for John Perry seems to be extremely important to Lord Boreal, but he doesn't really interact so much with Will until much later. Right. And in, in a different way, but he's already had a conversation with Will's mother who mm-hmm. is devastatingly portrayed here. Um, oh. And, and, and pretty much, how I pictured her, her ailment, like just sort mm-hmm. of the, the confusion, the frustration, um, the, the, the fear that she has, um, you know, she comes to, you know, will, we see will boxing at one mm-hmm. point and she comes in and this reminded me a little bit of, of that moment from the book where from the subtle knife, where he has to sort of defend her and these other kids are sort of coming for her and attacking mm-hmm. her. This was a, a little bit of softer edged version of that. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. Yeah, they took a little bit of the edge off in a good way. Uh, but he, 
there, there also shows that there's some awareness from adults that there's something wrong with her and he's mm-hmm. downplaying that she's having she's, she's just having small issues um, and she's okay everything's fine and he doesn't need any help mm-hmm. he's independent he absolutely absolutely but uh, you know his mother gosh I, I just want to hug her she it's so heartbreaking to, to see her like you said her confusion and how she just doesn't she seems afraid of everything mm-hmm. and um i mean what we may see is for good for somewhat of a good reason mm-hmm. but uh yeah i mean she's just so terrified of being outside and the the ticks that she has the things that she has to do to to calm herself down when she's counting the bricks outside or you know later when she's counting the the panels in the in the wood paneling it's uh it, it's really tough to watch it really is but not not in a you know a, a negative inequality of the show way but in, just in a um actually the opposite i think it's it's just it goes to show the uh the, the the strength of her performance agreed and and will will shows a lot here he, he shows some acting chops as well and he shows mm-hmm. his strength and his his fear and his uh desire to take care of her mm-hmm. um they have a good scene where he prepares a meal for her he makes an omelet for her yes um, and he you know looks at her in a way he, he really does he cares so much for her but he's also doesn't really know what to do he's mm-hmm. doing his best you know he's 14 years old he's just trying to do his best yeah and from what we've read of of his story as it continues in the subtle knife I can see that that you know this young actor is going to be a pretty good fit here. I think so. I really think so. It's actually funny. Um, as soon as he came on, he reminded me of uh, several of uh, my older daughter's friends. Yeah, like he's he's got the this the same look, the same build, just in general. He looks like um, several of her friends. Like I just imagine my daughter, you know, hanging out with Will, and mm-hmm. uh, it was it was pretty neat. Was, he's got uh, those gangly 14 year old shoulders that have just gotten yep. too wide for his body and he doesn't really know what to do with them yeah mm-hmm. still scrawny in weird ways <laughs> exactly what's so funny about uh about this and that you bring up the the age is uh i'm so glad that they've aged them up um because i don't think some of the scenes that we'll see later on you know some of the more active uh scenes would have um would have looked as good on screen with uh you know a, a smaller child i feel like a 14 a 14 year old boy um you know could potentially hold his own in yeah. uh, some of these situations especially now that we know that he boxes yeah uh, i don't recall that from the book um no. so so we've got a little bit of he fights in yeah. the book but but not right. he's not trained right so we've got a little context for uh for for you know his survivability later on and mm-hmm. uh that really worked for me i also liked you know speaking of the boxing um that will now has access to an adult that's that cares about him and cares about his mother and the situation and offers his assistance it's uh it's kind of nice because you know in the book they they led, led they led such an isolated existence and they still do this time but uh i think a lot of this now is uh you know, it's nice to see that Will doesn't lead such a uh, um, a hermetic life, you know? Yeah, the school is, you know, certainly his peers. He doesn't have a lot of friends or no friends, really. Um, mm. And, you know, young young people can be somewhat cruel and judgmental. But it was that, that small addition of his, his teacher that had some understanding of, of what he was going through and, and attempted to help, even though Will wasn't so much into accepting his help it's a good it's mm-hmm. a good moment and a, and a very subtle and simple change in addition that that works on screen and you yeah, mentioning I, I really you, yeah, that. and you mentioning the aging up if you you think about how they how harry potter plays out on screen and how what he's able to do and accomplish changes as he gets older and older and older Mm-hmm. And, you know, the later films, it's, there's so much more intensity and in how m- the things that he has to do are so much more strenuous mm-hmm. that if he was 10 when he was doing them, it just would maybe not be believable. You could read about a 10 year old fighting and whatever, because your mind can do certain things that they can't do on film. And it is it could lead to a more believable 
you know, scrappy young adult mm -hmm. uh, that can that can really take care of themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like the goose situation. You know, you couldn't come up, figure out a way to make the goose not look cartoony. Mm -hmm. you, you replace the bird. In this case, you age the actors up, and mm -hmm. it, it, again, it really worked for me. There's been there's been some funny Kaza discussions this week about you know well you know there's there's actually people that are not happy about the I change know. they're so frustrated I'm like so I had mentioned what you had mentioned in some thread and and people there was some back and forth and someone was like have, have you seen like the Aflac duck can you imagine them trying to do something <laughs> with that beak that doesn't make it look crazy I'm sure they figured it out it was very funny um, it's uh, so yeah the, the, these subtle changes they're carefully you're utilizing the material out of the first two books and and giving us you know, there's even moments later with the Egyptians that they've added elements without changing the sort of core of what what the story is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. absolutely so you know the, if it takes them three more years to finish the series will 17 be too, the, the question is is 17 will that be too old like will we right. oh it's good now but oh, now they're like adults <laughs> it's too old you know that's a grown man. <laughs> <laughs> he's got he's got beard. It was like John Hamm at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> so let's stay with Will. Let's 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 work this Will angle. We we don't have to jump around so much because it really we do live in the two worlds pretty significantly here. Do, we go back and forth and back and forth. Let's stay with Will's world. So Boreal approaches Will's mom mm -hmm. and talks to her and talks that that he knew John. And was not aware that he had, quote unquote, died. Uh, but he he's very forward with her. She sees his his accomplice in the car, and she's agitated here. She doesn't I, clearly doesn't like to be approached by strangers, but doesn't like to be approached really at all. Right. And Boreal is really trying to figure something out, although it's not clear as maybe a first time viewer what he is really trying to find out. Did you get an? feeling that this is supposed to be a mystery or are we supposed to start to unravel what he's doing? I think we're, we're supposed to be able to unravel that he's at least that we know he's looking for John Perry. We saw in the last episode uh, that, um, you know, that there were John Perry files. He knows what John Perry looks like. He knows his background. He knows that he's traveled between worlds. He knows that uh, John um, is out there and that, um, you know, it stands to reason that he's not even home. You know, mm -hmm. I, I mean, he had uh, Thomas, you know, or Thomas on his own, hack the bank so he could, uh, you know, see transactions and things along those lines. So they they knew that he wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure, though, what the, the real purpose of, of that conversation was other than to, you know, uh, kind of from a dramatic standpoint, established that uh, Boreal knows who she is. Did he maybe not know where he disappeared because the information about him being in Alaska, could that have been an important piece of information for him? If he's yeah, looking for another another window, perhaps? Uh -huh. I mean, per perhaps he, uh, he knew that he was missing, but he didn't know where he went, and he was hoping that uh, Elaine would know, mm -hmm. you know where, where he was. You mentioned but, the account. Uh, yeah, go ahead. But he also knew that um, she was miss. He, he, I mean, he knew he was missing, and he knew that Elaine was uh, in a delicate state. So um, I'm not sure. Did he intentionally, you know, throw her off her game so she would, um, you know, not not uh, be paying as close close attention later? Mm-hmm. I mean, clearly, you know, that's not what you want to do to somebody with uh, obsessive compulsive because that just did the opposite while you're on. Right. And, and, and him talking to her, th there's some, there's two things here. So he approaches her, he talks to her, um, but he doesn't have the information yet about the accounts mm -hmm. in, in that scene. And the accounts, you brought this up, and this it's an important element here. He he finds out that this this payout over time account that we learn mm -hmm. about in the subtle knife as well, that the the reveal here in the show, and I don't think it's as explicitly mentioned in the book, but in the show they say he knew he was going to be gone for a while. 
Yeah. You know, he's gone on dozens of expeditions and never once did he set up something that there would be a monthly deposit pulled from his account and given to his wife and his family. Mm -hmm. He knew that he was going to be gone for a while. So that reveal happens. But when he talks to her, he doesn't have that information. The, the information about the accounts make them want to enter the home right. and, and dig around and try to find some connection or some information or some clues. But if he... She, she believes that maybe they've already been in the house. She thinks mm -hmm. the rug has moved. She sees footprints. Is that her malady that's leading her to believe this? Or do we think that they've been inside the house already? I think they've been inside the house already. I think so, too. Um, yeah, because in the book, I think there were a couple of times they were in the, they were in the house. Yes. Uh, prior to the big event mm -hmm. uh, later. Um, but this time, I think we're going to get that one big event. That's going to be the, the time that uh, Will, at least, sees them in the house. Uh, we have the introduction of the cat also. We did. We did get the cat. <laughs> Fight murder on, cat. cat. <laughs> murder cat. We saw, I was like, ah, the murder cat. We get to see him. He looks tough, too. Doesn't he look yes. scrappy? He does. Yeah, yeah. he's definitely a parry. That is, yeah, that is Will's cat for sure. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so she she gets agitated in that moment where she thinks they've been in the house and she runs and that we get another reveal about Will's life and and she pull she opens up the the her secret compartment that's underneath the sewing machine and pulls out that pouch which by the way in my head is exactly what i pictured exactly. the pouch exactly. exactly the yep. pouch that i pictured yep and Color, she cracks it open everything, everything. Yep. and there it is all the letters Mm -hmm. uh, and this is Will did not know about these at this point. So mm -hmm. he's fascinated by them. He goes back to the area and he wants to look at them. And she comes in and says, you can read them. It's okay to read them. But he declines that offer. Why do you think he declines? Um, I, I think he may have felt guilty about the, uh, the invasion of her privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, she told him before that they weren't for him. And... Uh, he he didn't feel right taking advantage. I think of of, of his mother, so he couldn't do it this time. Mm -hmm. He just even though she gave him permission, he just couldn't bring himself to do it. I think that makes sense. Um, and as their story closes in this episode, she well she lets the cat in, our mm -hmm. murder cat, mm -hmm. and uh, she spots the accomplice sort of watching her. Right. Will is also having a bad dream in this sequence, too. Mm -hmm. um, I thought initially where we saw the car headlights and the brake lights, I thought that maybe we were going to get the home invasion in this Same, scene. So did I. I was so like, oh, 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 it was like kind of like sitting up and like waiting for something to happen. Mm -hmm. But he's he's agitated again. He's having bad dreams, but we don't know what the dreams are. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if we're going to get an idea of what his dreams are. Will we see inside his dreams? I I. I hope not. I'm kind of hoping we get some kind of conversation between uh, him and Lyra where uh, he, he tells her uh, mm -hmm. what their dream, dreams were. I don't uh, I don't feel like we need to see them uh, right. per se. Maybe when he's telling Lyra, we'll get to see them like reenact it or whatever. But uh, I don't uh, I don't feel like, you know, at some point, you know, we'll be in his dream as it happens. It coincides in, in the edit of the show. It coincides with the big moment that's happening in the other world, which we're going to mm -hmm. jump into what's going on in Lyra's world here in a second. And it made me think that they were deliberately connecting those two things mm -hmm. of what was happening and, and his, what he was feeling, or maybe he was seeing something. So I am curious to see what that leads to. That would be a really neat divergence from the book. Mm -hmm. If he's got some kind of, uh, you know, mental connection to what's happening in the, uh, in the other worlds. Right. Right. We know he's, he's yeah, we know he's you know he's important, and I guess we could jump to the other world here because early on in the Lyra side of the story, we get a voiceover, your favorite kind of voiceover, an exposition dump <laughs> from K Keza's voice. She's or he's flying over the Egyptian ca uh, caravan, and he talks about Will and Lyra, their connection, and what their role will be. The, they mentioned the end of she, he mentions the end of destiny mm -hmm. and and how important these two children are. We get this right here in this moment uh, with a with Kaza's voiceover. What, what was your 
What was your take on that? A little eye rolly. I'll, I'll be honest. <laughs> a little eye rolly. I was like, Could oh, it, okay, here we go. Yeah, again, whenever I hear that, I just hear Harrison Ford in Blade Runner, you know, mm-hmm. doing his, his voiceover. And I, I, I don't think we needed the app. I really don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so either. It's If we needed hand holding maybe later, it's not a piece of information we even need now, really. Mm-hmm. But also, I think we could have figured it out. But yeah. Why? Of course, we're following this kid through the whole episode. You don't need to tell me he's important. He's obviously important. Right. Um, I don't think the end of destiny term needs to be used yet. Mm-hmm. And Lyra, we know she's important already. Right. It makes sense because they're both kids that we can put two and two together. They're, they're going to end up having to sort of they're going to cross paths. There's just so many things yeah, here that are the subtext is there. Yeah, I mean, there are two kids the same age. They're going to connect. I mean, there's no way. It's like watching Watchmen, you know, yesterday. Oh, watching so Adrian. Oh, so good. But we'll, but we'll, watching we'll, like touch it, on that at the we'll get to that at the yeah. end. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you've got your Adrian Veidt uh, B story. You've got your Oklahoma A story. You know, at some point, they're going to connect. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's the same things happening here. There, it's not like we we assumed. Oh my gosh, there's going to be two parallel shows happening in this series. They're mm-hmm. they're there's going to intersect at some point in a big way. So Absolutely. don't tell me about that later. Uh, what what it, it, what what I took from that though is maybe we're not going to get some of our witch scenes uh, later on because that's where a lot of that exposition happened in the book. So you know maybe they're they're planning to cut those out. That would be a shame. Because Absolutely, that's, that's some good meat there. Mm-hmm. I wonder if, but there are also scenes without Lyra. Yeah, yeah, which we did. We get none of that in mm-hmm. in Golden Compass. Every she's yeah. in every scene. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting too, where, you know, Azrael's in the first episode, right? And we've seen hide nor hair of him since. Oops. You know, they really they really stuck with that. Yeah. I almost thought that we would see him like dilly dallying in his. It, at some point, they would show us this. But they have they've stuck with their guns with we don't we haven't seen any of him haven't heard him and this is like their biggest the mar- marquee star. Yeah, when I saw uh, there was a shot in this week's episode where there were some sled dogs, you know, pulling pulling a sled. And it was just a guy with um, on the back of the sled. I thought we were going to get Azrael. I really yeah. thought that that's what we were going to see, and it was going to be a scene kind of like uh, the Daniel Craig scene in uh, the Golden Compass, and mm-hmm. oh. No, no, and we only have three episodes left. It it feels like we really aren't going to see him until the very end, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I'm on board. Yeah, Professor X is uh, bus- busy at his uh, mansion. He is. He is. <laughs> um, so, Lyra, she really starts to. Her will is the way here, not mm-hmm. not not Will Perry. Her will. She is <laughs> willing herself. And her her story, she's she's moving her story forward herself. Yep. She's the one that's making things happen. She's driving this caravan in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, she's, you know, she also does those classic, you know, ask daddy, he says no, ask mommy stuff. There's so uh-huh. much like, care, she is kind of getting into that role of like carefully positioning herself, you know, calling John Fa, John Fa. And but calling him Lord Fa when she needs something. That was a great kind of line. I love how he immediately called it out. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then she came back and called him John. Like she's, you know, she really immediately was like right on board with that. Yep. I, yeah, I, I really appreciated that. It was very funny. Yeah, I uh, love so, their casual relationship that they developed so so quickly. I totally agree. There's there's very much like, and, and he's just, he is three inches taller than her. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> he's barely it's a taller guy. than her. There was a great moment where they were walking together, and I was like, he is big, exactly the same height yep. as her. Um, so she. She's using the lithiometer here, and they ask her to use it um, to sort of find things out about where they're headed and, and and what they're going to face. And she, you know, this is where she finds out what they're up against as far as the forces that are protecting uh, Balvanger, and you know the 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 sixty soldiers and the the guns and all this stuff. And there's, I think that's the moment where the the Egyptians know that they're going to need help to really do this. They won't be able to do it alone. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it, it was really neat um, how they've come to rely on her so quickly. Um, and, and 
they told us early on that that's what was going to happen, didn't they? I mean, mm -hmm. they said that she's more valuable than you know all the men that they brought. She mm -hmm. is the, the her ability to read the alethiometer is key to their mission, and they are one hundred percent spot on. Mm -hmm. It you know it, it reminds me that there's this is a quibble that we all had was she. She, you know, the, I guess there was a point that she could overuse the alethiometer. There, there was sort of a danger in doing that, but mm -hmm. she doesn't ask it much. No, and she could ask it so many more things. Yeah, but in this, it, because she's not asking it that many things, when she does ask it about what's going on at Bolvinger and what they'll be up against, it's trying to tell her other things. Right. It's trying to tell her about the fishing village. You need to know this. Why are you not asking me this? Yeah, you need to go. Yeah, you need to go and do this. This is going to be important. Even though she wasn't even asking that question, this is that alethiometer personality coming out already. Yeah. And so she's going to make. She has to do this side mission. Mm -hmm. And she's. This is where she starts to ask permission whether she can. And you know, John Fawes like, look, you're you're too important. And it's no, <laughs> no. Right. You know, did you talk to you know did you talk to Macasta about this? Um, of course she does eventually, mm -hmm. but it's like, she doesn't even know what this is. And, it, and it, she's not even talking about Yurik taking her at this point. She's like, mm -hmm. I'm going to go and do this by myself, by myself. And, you know, and Lee, listen, Lee does not volunteer, has no interest in helping. Like, <laughs> you know, he's like, Oh, I could fly you in that. Nothing. Nope. He's like, Oh, okay. That's, you got a mission. He doesn't, he doesn't see, I like that the whole scene where he's laying down on the sledge. Right. He's like, why, why walk when you can ride? <laughs> I mean, that's his whole thing, right? Like, he's he's an aeronaut. I mean, his yep. whole life is just riding around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was you a know? moment there when they were talking that there were, they, there were some demons kind of walking around, and there was a lot of mm -hmm. birds overhead. But there was a guy with a uh, a white, like, wolf on a leash. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, is that supposed to be a demon, or is that supposed to be a, a work dog? And, d and did they <sighs> save money by just getting an actual white dog right. instead of doing a CG dog? But they had to have one on a leash. Right. I, you know, I figured it was uh, Jon Snow showing up. <laughs> Ghost. <laughs> exactly. Ghost was there, yeah, dire wolf. Uh, so, so she is... She's determined to do this side mission, even though I think she's unsure about what... She doesn't even... She thinks maybe it's a ghost. I think in the oh. book, she couldn't quite read what that last piece was that the ghost was something she wasn't really sure that's exactly what it was trying to say. Yeah. But she does start to put together a plan here. She talks to Ma and Ma is somewhat supportive of her mm -hmm. going to do this. Mm -hmm. um, even though she's like, what did, what did John Fa say? You know, uh, but as long as once she sort of gets Yurik on board for this, I feel like she's in pretty good pause or hands. Yeah. I, I, once, I think that's when involved. it all felt. It, that's when that all came together. Yeah. You know, York said yes. Well, okay, she's going to have a polar bear with her. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I guess that and, can't go too badly. And Lee says, "Ah, Yurik, your first ride," and she goes, mm -hmm. oh, "I'm not heavy. Don't worry." And he said, "I'm not a horse." <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty good line. <laughs> it was. So he's already shed his armor, and he's going to take her. Yeah. Um, and what does he say? He's not. He won't be gentle. Yep. Yep. And he's very he, workmanlike. I mean, yeah, he's got a job to do. He does his job. You he know, pulls. That's... He pulls a bunch of stuff up a hill. Yeah. And John's like, "Oh, thanks for bringing the bear." <laughs> we really, <laughs> we really turns out we needed him. And you know, I really like that about John. Like, really quickly, he didn't. You know, his pride didn't get in the way. He totally. immediately said, "You were right. I was wrong. We needed the bear. I'm glad of it." How important is that in a leader? to admit when you've made a mistake yeah, or, or that you learned something, uh -huh. which is something that is sorely lacking yeah. in, le in leadership in these days in yeah. our real world. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's not, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't show weakness to say you're wrong. No. And, and I don't builds really. Up the people that are, that uh, you're leading. Absolutely, it, it reinforces for them that yes, I'm a competent person too. Yes, you, uh, there's a there's a certain amount of trust that you mm -hmm. hand somebody who can admit their faults. Yeah, someone who acts like they're holier than thou and is never wrong. It's mm -hmm. like they're just suspect to me, right? You know, and this is like the magisterium here, where like they are. 
infallible. You know, yeah. this is this kind of the Pope mentality in a way, you know, something like that. Yeah, like I like there. that. I like that comparison. That was a really good comparison between Magisterium and uh, and what we're seeing in, in John. That's it's awesome. so different. The, the community that he's he's built is, uh-huh. is built on trust and confidence and and unity, whereas um, Magisterium maybe is about, you know, dividing and, and uh-huh. you know, and dominating, dominating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, like, you know, as, as a parent, you know, you, you get it too. You don't, you can't always be right. You can't be the infallible father as, as much fun as you think it might be. It, <laughs> it, you know, it, yeah. it's, it, your kids need to hear that they, they figured things out from time to time. Mm-hmm. That they, they know what they need to do. And I think that was awesome. I think yeah, that was, that was a really, I completely agree. It really did stand out to me. She's, and he, he's okay deferring to other people. Yeah, and t- getting advice and getting advice from a fourteen-year-old, mm-hmm. and not what's just think, you know, yeah, what's not, what's just, think? not just about yeah, ex- yeah, good point, and not just about the alethiometer. Mm-hmm. He's like, she's reading this, but he's also trusting her in a way. Yeah, yeah, he does tr- her interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he trusts so, her to go on this journey. Yeah, yeah, it's re- it's really neat watching the Egyptian culture that they've built here. Mm-hmm. You know, Pullman did a, a lot of this because a lot of this is right from the book. Um, I love the the we saw a little bit of a strain in the book. I think between uh, the men and the women when they had to argue about who was going to uh, go fight, who was going to be part of the mission. Mm-hmm. But um, I think the way we see it on the TV series, the the women are valued. Mm-hmm. I, I I really see that, and I'm I'm. I'm oh, forward to hearing uh joanna's impression on this uh next week um i really feel like the the women in the tv show for at least egyptians you know we already know what um what what mrs coulter thinks of uh male female relations in the magisterium and the larger culture mm-hmm. but uh in the in the egyptian culture there's a lot more egalitarianism and i think it's really uh it's it's really well done, and, and now that you've you've made that contrast between the, their culture and then the the magisterium's culture, I, I think that's uh, a, it's it, it's a deliberate decision uh, on the part of the uh, of the the showrunners to, to to make that make that contrast. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. So she gets the go ahead to go on this this journey. Mm-hmm. And she gets to. I, I. I. Don't. I'm. I'm happy to admit that I got some little goosebumps when I saw her riding him for the first time. Yeah. Uh, and and good score. Um, yeah. It was cool because the terrain that they've been navigating up to this point is like uh, you know woods and rocky and and like a hilly, mm-hmm. um, you know, sort of close to. I guess is Wales. I think. But like close to the water, but like there's there's steep hills and and valleys, mm-hmm. and it's cold and there is some snow, but it doesn't feel arctic to me. Right. But they get to the point when they separate where it really starts to turn into the the, the true north. It's yeah. it's it's much colder. It's it's uh, there's fully snow covered spaces and and snow drifts and we're starting mm-hmm. to feel like that northern feel that i was sort of waiting for but i liked that transition yeah this is something the film didn't quite do as well it was like cold snow like right. it was like there was very little it was like immediately it was covered in snow so i sort of liked this sort of gradual progression moving yeah. into the the snow covered areas so he's loping along with her on the snow which is what i couldn't wait to see but it was nice mm-hmm. to see that it wasn't until that moment that we saw it and it looked, uh, you know, I liked when we saw in the distance when they were on the in that hilly area. We saw the snow line in the mm-hmm. distance. We saw yes. how this there was going to be a transition mm-hmm. between the two. Um, it wasn't, you know, I'm I'm in a temperate zone. I'm in a an Arctic zone. Mm-hmm. It, you know, where you're jumping the border. This was a, it was a, it was a little transition, and um, you know, I liked watching 
it, it was really cool when she was riding the riding the bear because uh, my my it's HBO so my my first thought was to compare it to um, Daenerys riding the dragon mm-hmm. and uh, I didn't get any uh, never ending story vibes from yep. this at all this this really uh, looked good um, it did look I, good and I liked the um, proportion of uh, her size to him because. Mm-hmm. She didn't look, you know, absurdly tiny on his back. I mean, she looked like a person mm-hmm. sitting on a bear's back, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, just well done. Just well done. Yeah, he, he's he's enormous, but like just the way that you know he lo- he runs and the way that she's sitting, it isn't. It doesn't. It's like oh my god, he's massive, but he is big because that. The point where she's sort of resting on him, which is kind of uh-huh. a cute moment where he's like, Rrr, you know, and yeah. she's like, oh, well, you're warm and I'm going to eat. And he's like, oh, yeah, you, know, you can stay warm, you know, which is a yeah. nice moment between them. But, you know, he he is so big, but there's something about that that sort of, you know, they they sort of had become one the way that they ro- they rode over time. She really yeah. felt more comfortable with him. And there was a nice I thought that was really done well. The, the effects in general in the show are really top notch. They really are. They the, really the, are. The movement of his mouth uh-huh. and his expressions and his eyebrows and his eyes, the way that he's very emotive. Yeah. Um, you know, this was something that like the Lion King this summer got knocked for like being, you know, the, the characters didn't have any emotion because they were uh-huh. so realistic. But they're they're sort of finding that balance where he's showing um, the movement of his face and his eyes are, are really showing more than just sort of a flat animal speaking. Oh, for sure. For sure. And and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the goose. You can see that they've got a high bar for quality. And if they can't meet that bar, they're going to do something else. Yeah. Uh, so she she. I got a little I got a little you get a little nervous here because we sort of know what's coming. Yeah. And um, they, they see the fish, fishing village from very high up. I was like, how are they going to get down from there? Uh, but they do. Yep. Yeah, they get down there. It's vacant. There's literally no one there. There was no mm-hmm. moment, except they did, I thought, a little bit of a nod to the book where there's a lit torch or there's a, there's mm-hmm. a lit lantern just sitting there, which I think in the book someone like leaves it out there or gives it to them or something Right after they have an altercation. Yeah, so I, I, I'm guessing that... Uh... This this seemed abandoned, but obviously it wasn't. Yes. Um, well, there's there's lights right. on and things. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They, and they, they put this they put something off way off on a dock, right. and locked it. You know, uh-huh. it, it's they're trying to keep it away, but they also this is where they live. Right. They don't know what to do with this thing. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The tension yeah. really builds here. So she's yeah. she's moving towards this this shed that's out on a dock. Pan is freaking out. This is a good moment that I thought was very reminiscent of the book. Yeah, poor little Snow Fox. Uh, um, he's so man. cute as a Snow. So yeah. cute as a Snow Fox. He yeah. doesn't want to proceed. Yorick stays behind, but it's they kind of add a little moment where she wanted him to stay behind so she, he wouldn't see that she was scared. Right. And she's liked, trying to master her fear. Because I liked how where that came from. You know, he when there it was when they were up yes. on that ledge, mm-hmm. and uh, what is it that he says? Um, she's like, are, are, "Are you afraid?" And not yet, but when I am, I shall master the fear. Mm-hmm. So what was cool about it was that he accepted that he was going to be afraid. Mm-hmm. He he doesn't fall into the hole. Oh, I'm never afraid. It's like, yeah, I get scared, mm-hmm. but I'm going to to conquer it. And then she decided that you know she's going to do the same thing. Because it goes back to what she was saying earlier about how she's part bear. Yeah, you know, I I feel like I'm I'm part bear too, and she was gonna uh, she was gonna find it right there. They're building a they're quickly building these relationships, but in ways that don't feel rushed. Yeah, the Lee relationship, which we can touch on a little bit too. They they've started to really gel, mm-hmm. and with Yurik and Lyra, they're really starting to gel here in this conversation while he's eating and she's eating. And she's asking about uh, the 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 bears and bear culture and uh-huh. um, why he's not a Svalbard bear. Yep. And he says, "Well, I, you know, I killed another bear." And she said, uh, "You know, they have a conversation." And she said, "Well, who do you kill?" He said, "That's not that's the wrong question. The question is, why did I kill?" Uh-huh. And she's learning a little bit. He's learning about her because of her curiosity. He's intrigued by her. Uh-huh. Uh, 
they even it's it's the show's really good here because in the book they even re, they even talk about how John Fa is essentially Yurik defers to John Fa to make the decisions. Yes. But at this moment here, they're finding a way here to show us Lyra and, and Yurik making a real connection. Mm-hmm. And they give us that moment where they stop to eat. If they hadn't give it, given us that moment, I don't know that we would have bought the moment later. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. They, we wouldn't have. And um, it kind of settled for me when uh, she starts doing the whole, when she starts getting super yappy. Because again, yes. you she know, won't, she won't shut up. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we've got kids. <laughs> we know what that's like. Oh yeah. But, but we know that they don't do that with just anybody. They're not going to do it with somebody on the street. There, that's that's the kind of thing that you do with somebody you're comfortable with, mm-hmm. that uh, someone that you feel safe with. Mm-hmm. And she felt that way with Yurik, and Yurik, you know, to his credit, you know, didn't like. He didn't like do a wharf and near the you know, full silent. I think it was from the Star Trek episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, he just eats and listens to her talk. Mm-hmm. You know, he becomes a safe place for her, mm-hmm. and, right there. And um, I think that plus the what you know his his advice for what he would do if he were afraid goes right to that moment where you know she's walking into that shed and she's drawing strength then from Yurik. You know, she may not have known him long, but we've already established that she is, uh, that, that he, he's secure for her. Yeah, she's, she's starting to show some bravery here mm-hmm. um, that we'll see as she develops. And she needs to develop bravery because of where she's headed just in this, this one book. For sure. And what's, what's about to happen to her next. You know, she needs mm-hmm. this. She's, this, this is a real learning you know, a real teaching moment for her. And she, she does, she does well, you know, she, she's afraid nope. she goes into this shed and she does have to manage her fear here. Uh, but it doesn't take long here. There's not a lot of, um, there's not some, you know, bat flies by and we all jump. Right. You know? <laughs> it's like, she sees Billy right away. Yeah. And Billy, well, before looks, she goes in, oh, uh, yeah. before we get to that, that riff house, her, her little litany, um, as she's, uh, you know, chanting it as she goes in, Two things came to mind, um, you know. Obviously, Dune. You know, I must not fear that whole thing. And then also uh, Star Wars. Uh, the you know, I am one with the Force, the Force with me. And that whole thing. Like I, I, I know there, there's something about those uh, chants that that people do in these things that that really that that speaks speak to me. You know, yeah. I, it's not like it's something that I do, but it's something that I kind of wish that I did in mm-hmm. uh, situations where I feel uncomfortable. The penitent man so, yeah. will pass. The penitent man will pass. Yes. <laughs> there, there, yeah, there's so many of those things that it, it's it allows you to move forward. It gives yeah. you not only a rhythm, but it also psychs you up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah good stuff. She So she opens the latch, a very small latch for, a, mm-hmm. for whatever they're afraid of, but she does open that up. And he's right there. There's no, yeah. it's like, boom, there he is. Yeah. And he looks, if not half dead, he looks three quarters dead. Yeah. He's, he's, he's yeah. vacant. He's staring off at his face. He's in the dark. He does not appear to have a fish in his hand. No. Uh, no but he, he is calling out for Ratter. Yeah. But he doesn't have a, a, a temporary demon. Yeah. Uh, she's, Lyra, to her credit, she scoops him right up. And she's right. she's afraid, but there is no like it's like it, Pan is behind her. He's still kind of like freaked out. She Pan grabs him and let's out. go. Yeah. Pan is freaking he's freaking out. And she grabs him and let's go. Yeah. And you know, this is another quick show edit, but it's like the next thing we see is they're rolling back up on the camp. Yeah. You know, and they have camped inside of a, a crashed dirigible, which is kind of a cool scene. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. But so they roll up on this and this is this is the emotional heart of the episode here. Oh, for this sure. Is, this is Ma and Billy and their moment and Tony. Yeah. And um, Lee, this is a great moment where Lee pulls Lyra away mm-hmm. and doesn't let her go into the tent. Yeah. Even though I think she does have a desire to do that. Yeah. He said, no, 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 this is for them. Yeah. This is for them. Yeah. Um, that was really good. Lee has some good moments here. We should talk about later too. But I also thought that was good, for, you know, just for the show. 
you know, telling us this scene is not about Lyra. It's not. I mean, he, he basically told us this scene is not about Lyra. This is about that family. Mm-hmm. Just so well done. So he's he's there with them. They it's it's Ma and it's Billy and it's Tony together. And she seems to know that he's not mm-hmm. going to make it. Yeah. Uh, and she sings to him, which is, it's devastating. Mm-hmm. Uh, she and, and Tony are a wreck, but mm-hmm. she tells him to go and be with Ratter. <sighs> yeah, I know. Yeah. That, that was, is, the thing is, with this whole scene in the book, this, Tony made that scene for me. You know, Tony was just everything about Tony was heartbreaking. With everything about looking for ratters, the fish, everything was, mm-hmm. was heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, the show didn't have that. Um, nope. Maybe because you know it, it's difficult to get that kind of uh, range from a, a child actor. You mm-hmm. have to different, different. You also have to introduce a new character, a completely right. new character that you have no emotional connection to, and they have. There's no one. You don't know their parents. You don't know their yep. relatives. Yeah. Yep. So, so you know what we what we got here, it, it ended up putting the emotional weight of the scene on Ma instead of on the on the on the child, and the actress and I I need to find her name was uh, just totally up to the task. I mean she she was outstanding. Her her cries as soon as she saw him all the way to the um, the way it caught in her chest. As she, you know, cried, cried when uh, when he eventually died. She was she was amazing, mm-hmm. a- amazing. Yeah, Little tremendous, bit. tremendous. And 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 another Tony also was very strong in that scene. Yes, the Tony Costa, you know, not yeah. Tony Macarios, but Tony Costa brings a little weight there. And Tony Costa, who's so tough and straightforward and strong, mm-hmm. and seeing him sort of broken and shattered together yep. with with his mom. That's a real. That's it was a really strong scene. Yeah. And I think that the, the, you know, if, you, if we had a, a MVP of this episode, I might say John Fa. Oh, because yeah. Because he's terrific. And then they have this funeral pyre. Mm-hmm. Larry gets up. She, you know, uh, Lee tells her that Tony died. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, uh, sorry, Billy died. Yeah. And she says, I want to see him. She goes out and they've built a, sort of funereal you know pyre. pyre and she goes over and ma's there they basically prepped it all and she's there with her flint and she lifts up and looks at him for just a moment mm-hmm. and steps away and, and ma lights the fire this is where another great big egyptian world building moment is john begins to sing and they sing basically a choral they, they sing together yeah, he, he sings, and they all sing together. And he sings a line, and they all sing together. There was a, it had a, a ring similar to what happened in the roping, but mm-hmm. in a in a different tone, and what was in a, a more a sad, a somber tone. Yeah, I mean the the roping scene was more about oh, uh, not not the, not the roping scene. I was I was thinking about the the scene with uh, where Tony was coming of age. You know, yeah, sure, yeah. He's he was starting his his new life, and now we're watching, we're we're seeing how they end the life, how mm-hmm. they see 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 someone off, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, that song. Um, I had a, a a quick thought though. I, I wondered is we we talked about this before, you know, with the 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 emotional in, intimacy between Ma and uh, John Fa. And then the line in the song was my son over and over. And I wondered, you know, partially was this because he's, you know, king, king of the Western Egyptians? Mm-hmm. Or was this, this goes back to our theater, theory, was that in fact his son? Mm-hmm. They're, they're very close, but uh-huh. they gave no moment really where he was alone with him. No. So I want, you know, I wonder. But, if you know, maybe he, 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 he didn't think think of himself as part of that family that that uh, ma would i mean ma that was ma's family mm-hmm. you know and maybe that that's the way it is in, in egyptian culture yeah you know yeah we don't know but uh but yeah it was uh that was a powerful powerful scene really good really good uh 
So before we come to the finale of this, let's back up just a smidge because there is a scene that sort of is a little outside of, of the main narrative is Serafina and um, Bartikorn together. Speaking of, speaking of powerful scenes. So we get to see, of course, we get to see her fly, which I was sort of waiting to see. And sure enough, no, she's not holding anything. So she just no. sort of flits around. She must have a teeny little piece of cloud pine in her pocket. But the way she flies, though, it's it's, it's so just gorgeous. This, I mean, it's like wind. It really is. Yeah, and so, like soundless. She just sort of yeah, you know, it floats, and it's just yeah, it's just wind. That's really all she is. Yeah, very light, like feather light. Yeah, it's kind of like a great Patrick, costume too. Patrick Swayze song of the eighties. She's like the wind. Oh yeah, good pull, <laughs> good pull. Uh, so she, great costume as well. Yeah. Um, sure. So she has, she speaks to, to Fartacorum and uh, James Cosmo does some really good work here too. He really um, he's really, really nice, really nice acting here. Yeah. Um, he's, their relationship is, is, is palpable. That, that what they've been through and his loss and where he fits in her life as long as it is. But how important he still is, even though it's but a blip, and how she says that you know, he doesn't look that old, doesn't look that different. Yeah. It's so it's so sweet and and ca- carefully chosen words that made him I don't know made him feel better. Yeah. Uh, but the there's warmth there. You know, I don't know that we see a lot of warmth out of Serafina. She's very businesslike, but there's real warmth there, and she does care for him. Yeah. Uh, and he's still devastated about his son. But yeah. this discussion about the th- the thin membrane between the worlds, mm-hmm. this is a little bit of exposition, but done in a more deft way. Oh, that's the, the scene was all exposition, but it was so well done. Yeah, it just wasn't like, I'm telling you stuff. This was a conversation between two people. Yeah. And so the thinness of the membrane between worlds and the, and the Northern Lights, Bartokorum is like, uh, can we? And she said, no. I know, because there, there's a. That really got uh, me. I bet Joe. I bet that hits Joanna. I bet Joanna definitely is going to pick up on that. Yeah, there's 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 a scene where he just says, uh, where she's like, anything can happen, anything happen there, and he just brightens for a second, like anything, and you know what he wanted. Yeah, of course. Uh, and she had to tell him no. Yeah. Uh, Not that. And then he says, you know, every you know every minute of well every day. He thinks about him, the the child, and uh, end of Seraphina. Mm-hmm. You know, that's uh, and, and all he wants is is that back. So a little piece of trivia about the, the end of the scene: she comes back, she gives him a kiss. Yep. This was James Cosmo's first on-screen kiss of his entire career. Really? <laughs> wow. Yep. <laughs> That's amazing. Isn't that crazy. The actor wow. Routina, Routina, who plays uh, Serafina, she posted that that this is his first on-screen kiss. Oh, that's sweet. She felt <laughs> she felt honored that it was her. Wow. A lot of beard. <laughs> A lot of beard. <laughs> A lot of beard. All right, so it's so a strong strong scene here. Yeah. Important scene. Um, his small arc here that we so wanted to be done well in the show i feel like they've really made us proud yeah for sure sure. they have every not every line's been said not every piece of the story has been said but they've gotten the heart of what it was that we cared about so much yeah so thumbs up on that right oh yeah yeah really good good acting too yeah yeah i I, i'm i i like james. i mean we said it i like james cosmo so much mm-hmm. and uh I, I don't have a lot of uh james cosmo you know uh experience other than you know game of thrones obviously mm-hmm. and uh he actually plays an aging rock star in a fantastic episode of uh, midsummer murders that oh. yeah you would love it you would okay. absolutely love this he's a he's an old bass player and uh he teaches uh, detective barnaby how to how to play a little bit it's uh it's awesome yeah, check it out. i'm sure my parents have seen it that's their favorite show i love it so the the pyre is is gone yep. and instead of a ambush battle right we get we get a subtle 
and Ninjas. careful ninja style yes. um, attack on the the Egyptians. Yeah. We lose two or three of them. They get their throat mm-hmm. slit. One gets his neck broken. His squirrel demon shh, goes away. Yeah. Um, and Lyra notices that something, or I guess maybe Pan says something's going on outside. Yeah. She comes, yeah. she comes right out. I mean, you know, Lyra, you know, she God bless her. <laughs> That's just what she does. Yeah. Uh, she comes right out and, and, and sees that there's some dead bodies mm-hmm. and she gets clubbed, like clubbed. Yep. Knock to the noodle. This to me, I was like, okay, clubbed credits, right? Same. I thought that was the end of the episode. And now, no, and no, now we got no, more no. stuff. Yes, she gets just like in the sh- in the book. She gets taken on a sledge yep. to Paul Vanger. Yep. It's not revealed. That's where it is. But of course, we know that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Great, great reveal yeah. of how she knows that's where it is. Great reveal. Very Silence the of the Lambs to me. Um, really strong. So she she gets, they bring her in. She drops the Lizzie um, Brooks. Lizzie Brooks, uh, you know, changes her name quickly and carefully. Yeah. Uh, and they also an interesting and deft way to show that she her demon hadn't settled. She like grabs for a pan and yeah. he changes to like a butterfly or a moth. Uh-huh. And she goes, oh, yeah, man, maybe not changed yet. Not changed just yet. Yeah. And so they admit her knowing she's that so she's casual valuable. With the way she's reaching for pan. Yeah, she's like, mm, and like pan yeah. changes. But it was like almost like a test in a way, yeah. a very simple way to show because you know that they're not supposed to touch them. Right. So they're going to they're going to immediately back off. Uh-huh. So, OK, well, we're going to get you some new clothes. They admit her. She takes off her clothes. They open up the cabinet and there's folded clothes and then the snowsuits, the same snowsuit that Billy Costa was wearing. Yeah. And she says, it's Paul Vanger. Yeah. And it, I mean, and she's there as vulnerable as she can be. No, no clothes. It's her and Pam. And she sees this. Mm hmm. Oh, what a way to end the episode. Yeah. Terrific. We were, you know, we were saying before we recorded that it was a tight and simple and straightforward, but but we got we, we had a lot a lot to discuss. There there was a lot, but uh, they they pace these shows so well, they yeah. really do. Because um, I feel like you know, at first the the each episode was about two chapters, mm-hmm. but now we've uh, not just done two chapters, but we've got gone deeply into the subtle knife. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, they're, and, they're, and it didn't feel feel rushed. It didn't feel no. uh, too packed. I feel like a lot no. of it's there. You know, that could be though because we we know the text really well now. I wonder what somebody who doesn't uh, would think about this. I I think that someone who doesn't know, certainly someone who hasn't read the Subtle Knife, I think there's still a chance there could be some like, who is this kid, and what's yeah. what mom, and why are they in our world? I, that that could be a little bit of a hump to get over one thing I've noticed I, I, cause I, I obsessively read about ratings and box office and stuff oh. that there's been a precipitous decline in viewership every week to yeah. week. Yeah. So that's not, not like it's not crashing and burning, but it's definitely been dipping in both oh. the UK and in America. I, th- I still think America is part of it. It's Monday night. It's just, it's not a good night for this type of series. It should be Sunday night. And I understand Watchmen's on Sunday night. I get yeah. it. Give me two um, shows on Sunday night, HBO. Just, it's okay. Right, give me eight and nine. Back yeah. to back, man. You're crushing yeah. it. This would Monday be a great feels eight like, o'clock show. Or Friday. I mean, Friday is not great. Maybe uh, Saturday night. Yeah. If they do their movie Saturday night. I can see they don't really know where to put it. Um, but, you know, they, they have, they bought their film. They've, I think they wrapped the second they've wrapped, season. They've wrapped the second season already. So we've got the second season coming. And then once you do two, you might as well do three, right? Yeah. I mean, then finish it out. Why would you yeah. even bother? Yeah. So it's, I, I like what they're doing here. I can follow it. You can follow it. Joanna can follow it. Readers can follow it. I just wonder if there's certain elements that are like, even though it makes sense that they're introducing it now, or it, is there like, what am I, what, there's a talking bear? Like, I wonder if there's, there's a little bit of a hump to get over as far as people really getting immersed into this world. Well, that, you know, that's the thing. And, and, you know, touching on Watchmen again, the viewership on that is supposed to be pretty poor as well. I read what? an article. Yeah, I read an article the, uh, yesterday that, that was entitled uh, the, the not the best show you're not watching. It's like, um, yeah, something along those lines. It's like the best show that you're not watching because nobody's watching it. 
Nobody's watching The Watchmen? Yeah. <laughs> Who's Zing. watching The Watchmen? Nope. <laughs> but yeah, apparently, um, you know, it's, you know, nerds are watching. I, I mean, there's no place on the internet that I can go where uh, people aren't talking about The Watchmen. Um, but uh, apparently, a general audience is not so much. That's and uh, I wonder if we're, like, hitting a point now where uh, we've gotten too um, esoteric, maybe? Is, is that the right term? We're getting, we, you know, uh, we're kind of uh, all wrapped up in our own uh, mythos, things that we know, and it's, e- it's, it's our shorthand. It's easy for us to get it, but yeah. for people who aren't, who aren't versed in all these things, they just don't. Yeah, I, I I don't know. It's if you if you look at viewership in general, and you and you see how things have changed with with I think fantasy and science fiction and superhero stuff in the past ten years. That there 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 was a time when it was like once superheroes kind of hit, and once you know Game of Thrones hit, everyone was hunting for like the next big fantasy property and the next yeah. big superhero property, and the next they're all trying to sort of push that, and it could be that because of game of thrones this could be hurt because of game of thrones you know Mm -hmm. not ending strongly in some people's opinions yeah um it's it's hard to say uh watchmen same thing it's like a super is this what these superheroes this looks really this looks like a downer of a show who's this blue guy you know i i don't know Mm -hmm. if someone isn't like people you have the people who love watchmen and refuse to watch it you know even people that in our in our circle are like i would didn't want to like it I was against it from the beginning. I, I, I think Lindelof ruined Lost and Star mm-hmm. Trek, and I'm, I don't trust him. And they finally started watching it like, this is the best thing on TV. Yeah. But you, you still have to get to that point, mm-hmm. you know? Um, mm-hmm. And you wonder how, how Watchmen's going to wrap up, too. Is this going to be sort of like closure? This is the end, because Lindelof has, has said that maybe this is only going to be a one and done. Yeah. But with with his dark materials, this is not a one and done. This is there's a ongoing story, and and they could easily do five seasons because there's five books. And right. the way they're playing it out, they could they could even tap into the Amber Spyglass because they've gotten a lot of yeah. the heavy lifting of the Subtle Knife out of the way. They can dive into the meat of Subtle Knife early next season, uh-huh. and uh-huh. then boom, they're off to the races, and we might be able to get further into the Amber Spyglass. You know, they could even get into the Ember Spy cast and do an adaptation of this podcast. Boom. I would I would, dinner. I would watch it. Yeah. Who would play me? Whew, I don't know, man. We'd have to, to give that some thought. Um, yeah. You ever watch uh, Bad TV? Yeah, yes. Michael McDonald. <laughs> awesome. That's a good one. <laughs> that, is, that is awesome. Okay. So who plays me? I said who I, I said who plays me, so you have to say who plays you. Um, well, Lord Boreal is already on the on this show, so clearly not. It's pretty hot. Though. Uh, <laughs> you know, Idris Elba's available. Get him. Get him. Yeah, he's available. He could do that. Exactly. He do I saw a picture of him in 1994. He's ready. <laughs> so, um, anything else? Do you want to talk about Watchmen for a second? Yeah, let's talk about Watchmen for for a second. Um, after last week, I think we all agree that last week was like one of those episodes where it's like, this is maybe the best episode of television this year. Yeah. And then this week happened. And then this week it's like, oh my God. Because I was, spoilers, I kind of thought that not having Dr. Manhattan in I'm it sorry, at all real, was... Real quick, let's, let's, let's put like a, a larger spoiler break in here. Spoiler. So pause, pause, pause. To watch this, Fast forward, yes. skip jump, ahead, 30 seconds, jump, jump, jump. jump. Yeah. Not having Dr. Manhattan in it was kind of genius. Yeah. Just like, hey, he's off there, he's not blah, blah, blah. Having these little phone booths that call, like, I like all that element that he's still present, but he's not there. Yep. This thing blew uh, my mind. It blew my what? mind. What? It, I, it was, you know, so when she said, um, it's like, you know, I just told you that Dr. Manhattan's walking around Tulsa. You don't want to know who he is. And she walks out. I was like, oh, I know who it is. You know, it's like, yes. Ah! And, well, and then so, they cut to the, uh, like, to the cow. It's like, oh, what, what, what are you going to do to him? Like, is that him? Does he know he's him? Like, ah! but it's funny because that weighs so heavily on what we thought about the episode. But so much stuff takes place up to that point. Yeah. It's such a crazy episode. Even like uh, Looking Glass. What is going on with Looking Glass? 
Looking Glass took those guys out, man. He did, but the last thing we saw from him is he was sort of a captive. Did we? Remember he they were showing him the the video they showed him the uh the video of Ozymandias talking to the president and saying that well, he yeah, sort of admitting that. all that and yeah, he just sat saw... there. He was not a he wasn't a prisoner, but they were making him watch it. No, he no, said no, you no, can do whatever you want he... now. But then he went uh, and he uh, snitched on Angela, got Angela captured in the police station, yes. and then went home. And then we saw those five Rorschachs follow show him. Up his, yeah, follow but, him into the house. But like, so, oh, yeah, you're right. I was kind of getting that mixed up because I thought the, yeah, you're right. Because he went to the, the mall wherever they had set up their shop and right. they abandoned JCPenney. He, right. And then he, I, what I'm guessing is he went on a murder spree when they came into his house. You know, that was, was he still a good guy. Yes. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, basically, he got uh, Angela arrested for Angela's own good. Mm-hmm. You know, they asked her to take her off the map. It was either that or they were going to kill her mm-hmm. and her family. Mm-hmm. Though we now know that that's not true, because if they, they weren't going to kill Cal, they, they were going to kidnap him. Yeah. Is he now in danger? So if Cal's if, if Dr. Manhattan has been released from his Uh human form is he now going to be can they kidnap him can they use him for this because now he's back to that all-powerful being that you can't really you can't do anything with maybe they can though remember um vite had in the book had uh, an intrinsic field um room that he used uh and briefly um took him off the board Mm. I mean, it was only briefly because then he then he said, you know, my first trick was to break, put myself back together. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm wondering if uh, they have something along those lines this time. And um, bringing this back to uh, his dark materials, <laughs> the box that they put her in in the trailer for next week. Oh, yeah. Uh, my first thought was, oh, my God, they're putting her in an intrinsic field remover. It, absolutely. Of course. <laughs> Which is kind of what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Just they're 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 kind of doing that. Something interesting though um, about uh, a Watchman, there was a, gosh, I'm trying to find it. Um, the na- Cal's name, his uh, name before he got married because he took a bar mm-hmm. as his full name. Pre before he got married, his name was Calvin Jelani. Okay. So. When I heard that, I immediately went to uh, to Google to find out what the two names mean. Mm-hmm. Jelani means great and powerful. Okay. Calvin means uh, bald guy. Whoa. So <laughs> Calvin bald, is great, powerful. Powerful, bald Yeah. Who is wow. that? Like, That's wow. amazing. That's wow. Amazing. I mean, you know, it, it opens with this Vietnam scene with Vietnam oh. being the 51st state and the explosion and her getting yep. the, the the video, the trying to get the video, right. you know, meeting her parents, seeing that happen, um, her the freaking grandmother, de- like, uh, devastating what she goes through. Yes. You know, she was lost and then found and then lost again. Yeah. Yeah. That's all just a tiny piece of that episode. There's so much going on. It's so meaty. And then finding out that the little girl was her mom, who she was implanting her mom's memory in. Yeah, I, I the... called that one, though, a while ago. I knew yeah, that. I had a feeling, too. Yeah. And, but what about uh, and then the, of course, there's the... the elephant in the room. There's the literal literally, elephant. literally the <laughs> elephant in the room. And how about uh, Veidt's, uh trial with the pigs? Yeah. What is going on? Like if I, you know, if I look over, like my wife's big into it. She she's loving the show. Yeah. You know, she was yeah. like, uh, uh, what is you know, like that whole all of Vite stuff is like, what is happening in this? Yeah. What 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 is he doing? What are, why are we following this guy? I'm I have a, a whole theory about it, but uh, that's for uh, I'll put that online someplace for something to read. They need to get get this podcast for my my crazy theories, but um. My wife, and it's funny, you know, we were just talking a few moments ago about if you didn't um, follow the material before, you may not get it. My wife has never read Watchmen. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm kind of glad of it. 
<laughs> because I was so into that when I was 14. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm concerned of what she'll think now. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, she, she was not a fan, but loves the show. Mm -hmm. And last night with all the, uh, the reveals, we were both on the edge of the couch. Just, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I kept jumping. I was like, Bruh! you know, there's so much stuff going on. Oh, yeah, it was really good, really good. All right, all right. So, so next week, um, it's going to be you and Joanna holding yeah. down the fort. I'm going to be taking a brief uh, sojourn, uh, and then we'll be Safe all travels. back together. Thank you. We'll be all back together on the 16th. Wonderful. And then Star right. Wars comes out that week. Oh, we should do a Star Wars episode. We should. We'll yeah. do. We'll do a, a bonus Star Wars episode. Nice. Yeah, I should awesome. see. I'll, I should be able to see it pretty early, so we'll, we'll try to do one. Yeah, I'm I'm going at eleven o'clock on Friday morning. Great. Yeah, got the taking the kids out of school. They're, they're gonna as have you, uh, as you should. Yeah, I've got to. They're both old enough. It's time to do it. It's time to <laughs> skip school for Star Wars. Love it. All right. All right. Have a good Continue. night. Take care. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.